you may be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis in the 18th chapter, the first few verses. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took a calf, tender and good, gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk, the calf that had been prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to them, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, They're in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season. And your wife Sarah shall have a son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. As you're able, would you stand as we affirm our faith today with a statement of faith made by the Canadian Church. It's the equivalent of the United Methodist Church in Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we sing together, His name is wonderful, and we prepare to pray together. If you're so inclined, you're always free to come forward and pray. Let's pray the same thing as twice.
us pray. Gracious God, as we gather together, first of all, we give thanks. We give thanks that you are the mighty king. You are the maker of everything. We give thanks for your mercy and your grace and your amazing love. And we ask you for forgiveness for the times that we forget to give glory to you. We give thanks for this amazing place where we live, where we live in more safety than 90% of the rest of the world. We give thanks that we live in a country where we don't have bombs and rockets going off in the skies over our heads, where we have the opportunity to live into the kingdom even now. We lift up prayers for those that are hurting, those that are sick, those that are yet still afraid to get back out. We live in a time where fear seems to be the, denominant, the, the prominent factor in our lives. And yet you have told us to fear not. Fear not and know that I am God. So God, as we gather together to pray and to think about our lives with you and through you, we ask you to give us grace. We ask you to hear our prayers and to give us the sustenance to live through the troubled times, looking forward to the ways in which the kingdom of God is present with us even today. God, sometimes we forget that we ourselves may be the first glimpse of Jesus that some of the people in our community may ever see. It may be through our acts of kindness, through our invitation into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that lives are changed, communities rebound, and the kingdom is lived into fruition on earth as it is in heaven. We give thanks for Jesus Christ who showed us what it was like to love beyond boundaries, across cultural and racial lines, and to be the body of Christ. And we, like the disciples, sometimes wonder how in the world do we accomplish that? What do we do? How do we even pray? And Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In just a few minutes, I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward. Uh, we uh, are grateful for the faithfulness of our church and uh, we are appreciative for all of our gifts, tithes, and donations they've received. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for the days to come. Today, as we offer our gifts to you in response to the gift of salvation you have given us, we ask that you receive them. Take them and use them to glorify God in this community and throughout the world in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
As you're able, would you please stand? <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. next hymn is one I always think we need to pay particular attention to the words. Come you sinners. Let's sing together. <coughs> Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. He had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is a need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. This message is entitled, Distracted by Many Things. But I want to start back with Genesis just a little bit in that passage where Abraham is uh, hanging out in his tent and these three mysterious people show up. And, and he goes and greets them. And when he greets them, he says to them, you know, rest here, stay here for a little bit. His hospitality is amazing. 
He said, I'm going to get you some water and, and some stuff, and, and you can wash your feet and rest. Washing your feet was a big deal when you went everywhere in sandals, I think. And so it was a place to be refreshed and feel better. I don't know about you, but sometimes it just feels good to take your shoes and socks off. Uh, you know, that would kind of be our, our equivalent to that, I think. And, and, uh, and so not only does he provide what he promised, he also goes and have him kills a calf. Now, you know, this didn't happen in five minutes. They were there for a while. And then they say, you know, we will pass this way again, which then tells you these people are really angels. And your wife, Sarah, will have a child. They've been wanting that all their lives. Sarah's old. She's in her 90s. She's an old woman. She'd given up hope. And out of that place of hopelessness, God says, have hope. This is one of those times when if we reflected on the Luke passage, we see the, what, what Jesus said. There's really only one thing that's important. And that's to love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Now, I know that the passage in Luke is a little bit controversial. There's a lot of people that think Mary should have got up off her knees and gone to do, do some work. I don't think that story is really about that. I think what it's about is that Martha was doing what she thought God was supposed to have her do, and but it wasn't that she was doing it with her whole heart. She was doing it begrudgingly and was angry, if you will, that Mary wasn't doing anything. In other words, what Jesus says, Martha, you're distracted by many things. I have an acquaintance that was a pastor in a mega church. He's not anymore. In fact, he's no longer what you would call an evangelical Christian. He's now a mainline Christian. And he said, we were distracted at that church by many things. How big we could be, how much money we could get, how fast we could grow. And we weren't paying any attention to God. We weren't putting Christ first. We were putting the church first. I just wonder if maybe we too are sometimes distracted. I get distracted. Some days I think I have attention deficit disorder. I could be busy doing something and telling the story and my the whole thing's gone. I don't even remember what I was talking about. I, I start off in one direction, I leave a room to go get something done, and I, and I get in there and I'm distracted by what's going on in the room and I forget what my task was. I don't know if you ever have that sense of distraction, but I think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Mary is, is doing what she's doing, and Martha, if your task is to prepare the food and take care of stuff, quit worrying about Mary. How many of us Christians attempt to judge other people by where we are? Now, i got to tell you, I don't do that very often because I don't think I'm very high on the scale. I wrestle regularly with my faith. I know for sure I'm saved, but I also know that I'm for sure supposed to be a better Christian than I am. When I was going through ordination, there was a preacher in our conference, and she's retired now. Her name is Rita Sims. And she was on the board, and they were interviewing me, and as I sat down in the chair with... I don't know, there was 10 or 12 people there, and they're going to quiz me and question me and ask me about my faith. And the first thing Rita looked at me and she said, what's the state of your salvation? Anybody ever ask you that? I'm not talking about the way that God's on your door and says, have you been saved? I mean, what is the state of your salvation? Now, I'm being judged by my answer. If I don't answer it right, they're going to ask me to leave. So I said, I'm still working it out. Aren't you? Aren't we still working out our salvation? I mean, I know we're saved, but Jesus says there's more to just get to heaven. What are we going to do now? Even the prayer we just prayed says we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven. I think about that every time we pray it. Are there any hungry kids in heaven? No. Are there any people that need health care in heaven? Are there any people that, that need all the stuff we strive so much to have in heaven? And yet Jesus says, make that happen on earth. Amen. And we're called, I think, as people of Christ to care. There's another passage we didn't read today. 
and it's in Amos. And Amos is a prophet from the Old Testament and he says, you people that continually to ignore the poor and continue to ignore the people that don't have, you will reap the, the reward of your behavior. And we live in a time where, where it seems to be, how much can you get? How much can you have? And there are so many people that would just like to have something. I know some of you have been where I've been. I've been in a place where a flat tire was a major catastrophe. If you don't have a spare, you don't have a lug wrench. And we can get easily distracted. There's a story about that where a guy, one time I had a flat. I was out in East Texas, somewhere around Jasper. I was on a little farm road and uh, there was pine trees everywhere and no people. I was in a company car. I had no idea what, what the situation was, but I had a flat. It was, had good tires, but I had a flat. And so I got out and I had a jack. That was good news. And I jacked up the car and I undid the lug bolts. Everything my daddy had taught me to do, I did it the way you're supposed to do it. And the wheel wouldn't come off. It just would not come off. There were no lug bolts. It just would not come off. And there were no people around. There was nobody to help. And the radio that we had to call back to the office, it wouldn't reach from there back to Beaumont. And I, I just didn't know what to do. So I started looking around for resources. It was hot. It was summertime. <laughs> I opened the glove box and there was some de-icer. I'm thinking, well, I don't have anything else. And so I squirted that stuff on and the wheel just fell off. I don't know why that happened, probably because the stuff was cold and the wheel was hot and it created a temperature change. But I've been where that guy is when he's out in East Texas and he has that flat and he opens up his trunk and he doesn't have a lug wrench. So he says, well, I'm gonna go get me a lug wrench. I saw a house a couple miles back. So he goes to walking along, it's late in the afternoon. You know, when you're in East Texas and the pine trees are so tall, it gets dark pretty early. Some of you have been there. He's walking along and he says, man, what if that house doesn't have a lug wrench? What if he has a lug wrench, but he won't let me have it? I mean, he really builds himself up into this major catastrophe. Have you ever done that? He finally gets there. By then it's dark. The porch light is on on the house. He knocks on the door and he hears a bunch of grumbling inside. The guy comes to the door, and as the guy opens the door, he says, forget it, I didn't want to borrow your Doug Garn leverage anyway. <laughs> we get distracted by, we, we forget what our main task is. Friends, I gotta tell you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, your main task is to resist evil and to proclaim the gospel in all that you do. That's your main task. And if we can remember that and we do it with our children and we do it with our spouses and significant others and the circle of friends that we have, if we become people that are proclaiming the gospel, glorifying God and everything that we do, then we are eventually going to accomplish the task. But here's the thing, we may not ever get to see the result. You don't know when that time that you're kind in, in adverse circumstances, like Abraham was, when you do something special for somebody else, the next thing you know, you're, you get a reward for it. In, in Sarah's case, she gets the baby she's desired all these lives. But our distractions keep us so focused. And so I, I was telling one of our people here just a little while ago, when I was a kid, if something happened, the biggest news story I remember as a child was the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't know about you, but that's the first big news story. I remember everybody sitting around and talking about it. Y'all remember that? Wondering what was going to happen when, when they, if they put those ships between here and Cuba, whatever it was, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. At school, we'd be on the playground and we had visions of what it was going to be like for this bomb to come down. I, I probably could draw you a picture of the vision I had of that. And at school, they were teaching us how to put our heads under the desk like that was really going to stop a bomb. <laughs> and, and, and some of you are old enough to remember that stuff. And, and it was one of those times when we lived in fear. There were a lot of other things happening in the world, really scary things. Polio was rampant. But unless it touched you directly, you didn't think much about it. 
We didn't, if something happened in, in North Carolina or in South Dakota, we didn't hear about it on the news. We heard about what was going on here around us. There was no uh, internet, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no instant communication. But today, today, something can happen in Maine and we're going to know about it tomorrow. And so we live in this time where we've been fed this information by the news or the, the media or whatever you want to call it. And, and we've decided that the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. And we forget that we live in a pretty darn safe place. In a place where there's more jobs than there are people. In a place where there's a lot of work and there's a lot of good stuff going on. And not one of us had a, had a, a big issue getting out of the house this morning to come here. There were no police standing on the corner. There were no guns pointed at other people. Sometimes we forget because we're inundated with this stuff that creates this sense of fear. A kid gets kidnapped in, 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 you know, in California somewhere and we don't let our kids go out anymore in Pasadena. We, we've taken all this stuff and we've made this global fear become our magnificent fear. And yet Jesus says to, to Martha, Mary is focused on the one thing. What would happen to us if we let go of some of that stress and turmoil? I, I can assure you we'd probably have lower blood pressure. We'd probably live longer. We'd probably be a little bit happier. We, we get a chance to, to live in the joy of a community that is safe, that has people that care. That, that we, I met a, a couple uh, on a golf course a couple weeks ago, and they were from Florida, and the, the lady said, to, I just want to tell you, what I love about coming to Texas is that you can be anywhere and people speak to you. <clears throat> that doesn't happen everywhere, friends. You can be at the grocery store walking past somebody in the aisle and they'll talk to you. You can be at, a, at, a, at, a, at anything and, and people say hi. People wave at you when you go by. People are different here than they are in some other places. Shouldn't we be grateful for that? Shouldn't we be thinking, boy, I am blessed to live where I live. Pasadena, Deer Park, LaPorte, Southeast Area County, it's not the prettiest place in the country. But it is one of the safest. It's one of the places where you can pretty much go about doing your business the way you want to do it. I'm not saying we don't have any bad folk and we don't have any crime, but it's minuscule in comparison to real life. You know, turn on the news and watch what's happening in Northwest Harris County and other places. You know, we are just blessed to be where we are. And so many times we're, we'll sit around and we talk about all the stuff that's going on somewhere else and we forget about all the stuff that's not going on right here. I think sometimes what, what you take this passage from Luke and you say, well, what is that one thing? Yeah, Jack Palance said that in that movie. Somebody help me with the name. City Slickers. City Slickers, thank you. There's one thing. I, I, what is that one thing? I'm distracted. That's why I couldn't remember. <laughs> we do get distracted though we forget what our main focus is and i think jesus tells this little story so that we can understand let's don't make it so much about mary and martha let's make it about us are we distracted from doing the god's kingdom work right now by what's going on in the world do we let something somewhere else make us be handicapped locked up kept away there are so many good things in our lives. Uh, one friend this morning said, we should be grateful that God got, I don't know how you said that, John, God got us up today, right? You're blessed that He woke us up. Maybe God just made you wake up today because God had some work for you to do. <laughs> Maybe God's thinking, you guys haven't done everything you need to do for the kingdom yet. Get to work. How do we do that? Well, we can do it some at church. We can be like Abraham, and when we have a guest or a new person come, we can be gracious and kind to them and welcome them and offer them even more than, than they would expect. <coughs> but I think more than that, we, we, can, uh, we can be people that understand that we're not doing this for us. We're not, our goal in life isn't to grow a bigger church. Our, grow is, our, our job is to grow the kingdom. Our job is to get people interested in a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And Christians and, uh, and others can be pretty judgmental about how they do that. One of the things I liked about AA when I first got there, and now I understood who Jesus was and I understand who Jesus is now, but in AA they use the word higher power. I want to tell you, friends, sometimes that's the first step. People need to understand there is a power greater than you. And they may not be ready to yet know that that's Jesus Christ. They may not understand the ramifications of all the doctrine that comes with being a Christian, but they need to know that there is a power greater than them. It's more important, more powerful, more able, more willing than anything they can imagine. And then our task is to say, yeah, that higher power that you already know exists, that's Jesus. Maybe you didn't know who it was. Maybe you don't know the stories I mean, a lot of people didn't grow up hearing the stories. They don't know the stories. My friend Bert Palmer at Kingwood Methodist today is preaching on Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is one of those great stories in the Bible. Y'all remember the little tomb, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. But, but it's interesting to think about what it meant for a person to go and not a, a, a bona fide sinner I mean, really, he was stealing from his people. The least likely of anybody that Jesus would call down from a tree, invite to, to say, I'm going to your house today, and would then convert or save or transform an entire family. The thing is, we go out in the world and we are people that expect results. We, we think the outcome is predictable. If we just do this, we'll get this. It's in God's world, it won't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Well, if we do this, God will do this. If we do what we're supposed to do, and we trust that God is God, God will take care of stuff. A, a great example of it, too, when we had the, the service for Patrick on uh, Wednesday. It was an interesting time for many of the family because Patrick had been estranged from the family for years. 20 or so. And so when I'm doing my work as the preacher to try to learn everything I can about the person who went to be with God, it, it, there was a gap. There was a place where at one time we didn't know what we were going to say. And, and you know, God provided, because God provided at least 10 people that, that Patrick worked with, plus his preacher, to show up in church for that service and tell us some stuff we didn't know. He was active in church. Bless him. Good news. It means that he had a place to go back from the stuff he learned growing up. He was active in church. We got to meet his preacher. The people he worked with said, this guy was the sweetest, kindest, most willing worker we had. If we asked him to do it, he did it. Now I'm going to tell you, we didn't know that was going to happen before. That was an unexpected outcome. One I think provided by God because God knew who Patrick was and what Patrick was up to and God knew that we needed to know. And we did. And what a blessing it was to the family, to his sister, to Johnny, to Faye, to others that were here. What a blessing it was to find out that this young man was not only a Christian, but that he had turned into a person that was looked up to and cared for by others. So many times... We don't know what God's going to do. Believe me, Sarah had no clue that she was going to have a baby. She wanted one. Well, she had for years. I'm sure she had given up. And those unexpected outcomes are the things that we know when we do what Mary did and we spend our time with the Lord, that the Lord will provide in ways that we never, ever expected. I think healing happens in all kinds of miraculous ways too. Sometimes healing is physical. Sometimes, you know, God does things and people's cancer goes away. Sometimes God helps people's blood pressure. Sometimes God provides a doctor that can help them. Sometimes God provides in all kinds of ways. And you know, sometimes healing happens spiritually so that we're able to accept the suffering. That we're able to understand, yeah, we're going through a tough time right now, but I know that this is temporary because God has promised me better. The problem I had growing up is I thought that better happened when you died. I thought you had to die to experience God. I remember as a young kid after my grandfather had died, it was probably 1957. 
waking up, you know, I was in my bedroom and, and I was thinking about death. I don't think I really had thought much about it before that. And I went in and I, my dad, I'll never forget this, he was washing dishes. And, and I, you know, looked up at him, I'm a pretty little guy, and I said, uh, Dad, am I going to die? I don't really remember exactly what his answer was. I don't think it was yes, but not tomorrow. <laughs> that might have been my answer. I remember when I was on the way to my, my first mother-in-law's uh, funeral service, I had my, at that time, he was about two, a little over two, my oldest boy in the car with me, and he said, Dad, when Grandma died, did she go to heaven? And no matter what I really thought, I said, I hope so. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> and, but his question was, how did she get there? Is there a stairway? Did she get on an escalator? Did she ride an elevator? I said, you know, we don't know how she got there. But we trust that God has a way to provide for every single person. And I believe God has called everybody to service. I just think some people haven't heard the message yet. When I was a salesperson, <laughs> I know some days are depressing. You get a lot of no's, you know, no, no, no. And you have to get this mindset that says, hey, it's going to take a certain number of no's to get a yes. And you have to just keep plugging through because you know that, that time that you make that extra effort, you do that one more thing when you're not distracted. I made a lot a lot of sales afternoon on Friday when most of my other sales buddies were taken off to go do whatever they wanted to do. Because you know what I found out on Friday afternoons after lunch? A whole lot of secretaries are gone. A whole lot of offices are kind of bare bones down to just the decision maker. And a lot of people are kind of wound up with their week and they're kind of open to hearing something. I was able to do a lot of communicating with people. I remember going to First Liberty National Bank a number of times and the, the, the cashier, she, that's kind of like the gatekeeper at the, at the bank, she just would not let me get past her little cubicle. And one Friday I was up there and I went in there after lunch and she was off. And I got to talk to the president. And you know what? I made a sale. You got to keep going even when you don't think there's going to be a right answer, even when it hurts, even when there's a little bit of pain, even when the doctor says things don't look good. You know, you don't know what God has in store until you live it out. I remember a friend calling me. Said my mother is in a nursing home. She doesn't have long to live. She wants to die. Would you come and talk to her? I went and met her. I hadn't met her before. and We visited for a little while. And she said, I just don't understand why I haven't died yet. And I said, because God has something else for you to do. And when God's done with you, God has other purposes for you. God will restore you to life. A new body, a new spirit, everything good. No sickness, no, nothing to work for, no things to worry about. That's in our future, friends. Do you believe that? Amen. We're headed there. One day at a time, we're headed to that place. But don't sit and miss life right now waiting for that. Because something you say, something you do, that one time when you reach out to somebody you never thought would pay attention, they may find a way to be introduced into the loving grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, where they go to church, we shouldn't judge them. All kinds of different churches are out there. We're all in the same business. It's my prayer every weekend that every church in our community would be filled to the brim. I believe that when one church prospers, they all prosper. I believe a raising tide raises all the boats. And I believe right now our community is crying for a Savior. I believe everybody is looking for hope. I just don't think they know where to find it. They're kind of like Martha. They're going around saying, I'm doing the right thing. Why isn't it working out? And Mary is the one that gets it. She gets it. She says, and my job is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, even if the dishes don't get done. Because you know what? You can wash them tomorrow. And I think some of the time I think about the things that kept me from attending church services in the past. There was time I didn't go because I didn't like the preacher. 
Y'all can't believe that, can you? <laughs> there was another time I didn't go because I had other stuff to do. It was a good time to go play golf. It was time to go fishing. It was time to do stuff. Everybody else was in church. The free and My mother actually told us one time, let's go camping on Easter Sunday because our church will be full with people that need to be there. We can be distracted. And it's my prayer that, that we, we don't need to, to take some drugs for it. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of kids that get distracted. I've worked with so many kids at camp, and distractions are everywhere. And one of the great things about camp is we take away some distractions. As far as I know, there's no real video games at camp. Where people actually have to get out and walk around and do stuff and talk to each other and build relationships. And they do, don't they? One of the things that Dawson, Dawson's his name, right? One of the things Dawson said, y'all remember when he stood up there and he said, I met a family I never knew I had. That's what happens when we put down stuff and we, we, we focus on the right thing. And I believe God created community. He created us to be in community. And in that community, we experience the kingdom right now. Even when it means we're praying for people that aren't here because we know they're sick or they're, they're, maybe they're in the hospital or maybe they just didn't feel like getting up to them. Or maybe they too were distracted. And we can set an example of showing them that we, we really get it on what's first. What's the one thing, the one thing that never changes? I think it was Augustine that said one time, this is like hundreds of years ago, that of which there is no potential is God. Everything else has potential. And every other person has potential. Every person. Every person. And that's the struggle that we have when they say, yeah, but they're not like me. They don't look like me. They don't think like me. They don't eat the same food I eat. Whatever it is. They don't go to the same kind of church I do. They don't, they don't worship the same way I do. They don't sing the right songs. They don't use the right instruments. You know, who cares? If they're going, if they're striving, if they're trying to meet Jesus Christ face to face, they're working so that when that time comes that they walk through whatever that experience look at, looks like, like crossing the river or whatever it is, when they get to that place, they're not going to go meet a guy they don't know. As I heard this morning, they're going to jump into the arms of a friend. And Jesus will look at them and say, Good and faithful servant, welcome home. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I know I tell it every time we sing this song, but Thomas A. Dorsey wrote this hymn back in the 30s. It was before cell phones, it was before the internet. He received, he was a performer. He received information that his wife and daughter had died. He went to his buddies at the church. They told him things like, well, God needed another angel, stuff that wasn't particularly helpful. And he went home, and in one setting, he wrote the words to this great hymn, Precious Lord, take my hand. As you're able, would you please stand as we sing together. Precious Lord, take my hand. If today be the day you unite with our church, come forward as we sing. Precious Lord, take my hand.
Precious Lord, take my hand. This is just an assignment. Sometimes when you're Googling stuff, Google Thomas A. Dorsey. It's not Tommy Dorsey, the big band guy. They have a, a video of him singing this when he was about 95 years old. Out of his pain and suffering, he says, Precious Lord, take my hand. Isn't that what Mary did? Isn't that what Jesus calls us to do? Amen. Friends, go in peace. Amen. Amen.